The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon Charney report. As promised last week, we told you we we're going to play a tribute to Abba Ibn, the great Jewish diplomat statesman who died about a week and a half ago. Many of you may know, many of you may not know, but let me give you a little history of uh, Aubrey Ibn. He was born in South Africa under the name of Solomon. His father died very young. His mother, who was an ardent Zionist, moved to England, and she married a doctor by the name of Ibn, and he became Aubrey Ibn. He graduated Oxford. He was offered a seat in Parliament. However, he was in the uh, British Army and he was over in Egypt and he saw the suffering of the Jews in, uh, obviously, in World War II and uh, he saw a lot of what was going on with the Jewish immigration to Palestine. He was uh, an ardent uh, supporter of Chaim Weizmann, who became the first president of Israel, a great Zionist, and Moshe Sharet, who was uh, later on to become the Prime Minister of Israel, and he was head of the political division of the Jewish Agency, was the uh, progenitor of the, uh, of the uh, Palestinian the Israel, the state of Israel. Uh, in any case, Ivan was uh, an intellectual giant and was noticed by Weizmann and Charette and was asked to uh, join, at, at that time, I guess the Palestinians in Israel and to become one of their spokesmen. He reached the pinnacle of his career, I guess, in 1948 and 1947 during the partition, UN Resolution 181, where Iban uh, talked on behalf of Israel. He was brilliant. He became the youngest member of, uh, or the youngest delegate to the United Nations at the age of 29. He uh, was uh, the first ambassador, Israeli ambassador, to serve in two positions, both the UN and in Washington. That's quite a feat at, in those days. He arranged the meeting, by the way, between a famous meeting between Harry Truman and Chaim Weizmann, the president of Israel, which everyone says was significant in the recognition of the state of Israel. He also delivered a letter on behalf of uh, David Ben-Gurion, the prime minister of Israel, to Albert Einstein at Princeton. He spoke about it on our show. And he told me how exciting it was for him to go there to offer him this uh, position. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for Albert Einstein, he declined. And uh, as you know, I think, if you don't know, Einstein was a great, great Zionist. The thing that's really important about Abi Iman is after the Six-Day War, when Israel had a glorious victory and captured so many lands, uh, Iman said, you know what, this is the time we have to talk because we can't be occupiers. And his position has always been talk and talk and talk to your enemies until you come to a, a position where both of you agree and you have a peace. And you'll see a lot of that in the collation and the snippets we put together. His words are glorious and uh, he was a great man and uh, every Jew in the world will surely miss him. Today we are honored to have with us Ambassador Abba Ibn in my opinion, the most celebrated political figure of the last 40 years to come from the state of Israel, and that includes Moshe Dayan and Ben-Gurion. Now, he may get a little upset about that, but uh, if you ask any Jew around the world who they would like to hear most from, it's Abba Ivan. Maybe in Israel it's always not that way, but I know wherever I go, everybody says Abba Ivan. And for the last, it doesn't seem that Abba Ivan is more than 40 years old, but he's, he's been with the state of Israel as its first ambassador in Washington. Anyway, welcome. Mr. Ivan, Ambassador Ivan. Well, thank you very much for your very objective words. <laughs> I'm like Henry Kissinger. I'm subjective. Uh, today, a report from Syria that uh, Mubarak, the president of Egypt, met with uh, President Assad first time. Uh, Mubarak has visited Syria in a long time since Camp David. And they speak very, uh, in a sense, very toughly about uh, what to do with Israel. Israel is now a common enemy. You see any political ramifications? Firstly, Husni Mubarak is a very successful statesman. He inherited an Egypt that was scorched earth. 
no relations with any of the Arab states, expelled from the Arab League, expelled from the Organization of African Unity, expelled from the non-aligned countries. Now everybody's back in Cairo. All the Arab ambassadors are back while the Israeli flag flies in Cairo. He's president of the Organization of African Unity. He's a centerpiece in the peace process. He has a, an alliance with the United States. He has renewed relations with the Soviet Union. So he is a very constructive and dynamic force, less flamboyant than Sadat, but in my opinion, more successful. Now, uh, this statement about Israel is very largely a response to the extraordinary period that we're living in Israeli policy. For the first time in its history, Israel is refusing dialogue, not simply turning down proposals in a dialogue, refusing to enter a dialogue and to explore whether the peace prospect is available. At this time, Israel is putting its uh, claim to 100% of the territory and 100% of the sovereignty in the whole of the area between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean. I testify as the last central figure in that drama that if we had asked for 100% of the territory and sovereignty, no country would have recognized our legitimacy and the world would have organized successfully to um, prevent our emergence. We have always had a policy of respect for the holy places. And here we have these settlers bursting in with guns on the holy day, destroying 800 years of serenity in the Christian high place, holy places. In Jerusalem. And Prime Minister uh, Shamir says, any Jew can live exactly where he likes. But if he says that, is he also going to say every Arab can live where he likes? Could armed Arabs come within a few yards of the Wailing Wall and start establishing a settlement? It's nonsense. There's a special status for the holy places recognized in our Declaration of Independence. All of this together, contemptuous remarks about the United States, rejection of the Baker Initiative, and now the creation of a government which will be dominated by the forces of irredentism and the proponents of violence. That is what has led to a world reaction, a world reaction, an American reaction. I've never known the United States in greater reserve and indignation. And of course, the Arabs react as well and even more deliberately. On the whole, I think um, Mubarak will not ally himself with anything to do with war against Israel. Moreover, when um, President Assad says to somebody, not just somebody, but the former president of the United States, President, the principal, Carter. Uh, president Carter, whom I spoke to about this last week, I'm willing to discuss peace with Israel, the least that a lucid and rational government can do would be to explore. It may not be anything. I find it intolerable to see that our nation refuses to explore. In case, heaven forbid, the prospect of peace should emerge. Now, so long as we have a policy of refusing to explore, claiming 100% of the territory and sovereignty, ignoring the immunity of the holy places, we're not going to be popular anywhere, not only in the Arab world, but anywhere at all. Therefore, we are in a very deep confusion about our, our structure and our values and our political system is paralyzed. Mr. Shamir lost the confidence of the Knesset and hasn't regained it. And yet he sees himself as entitled to create new and dangerous realities. This is a very bad period in our country's life. I can only hope that we have the resilience and the good sense with which uh, to emerge by the strength of public opinion calling for change. This must bring tremendous heartbreak to you. I mean, we just celebrated Israel's 42nd anniversary. You were one of the founding fathers of the State of Israel. You sat with Harry Truman and had him declare that uh, the State of Israel should be born. Uh, what happens to you emotionally in 42 years? How do you feel today? This is not a, a moment of satisfaction. I'm now uh, trying to make a television series which will evoke again uh, the um, atmosphere of the early years when we were young and it was morning and it was good to be alive and when almost everything seemed open before us and although progress is usually regarded as looking forward for Israel progress would be looking backward to the conditions which made our sudden emergence feasible to the period when Israel was the center of world admiration to try to recover the lucid visionary attitude of pragmatism and compromise and to understand that in the modern world, those who say all or nothing are much more likely to get nothing than to get all. I can only hope that the very intensity of this crisis, and it's very intense domestically, internationally, regionally, will bring about a new kind of surge of conscience. And that uh, from the people themselves, there will come a demand not to put up
with that kind of leadership. Do you see Israel becoming very right-wing now, sort of Khomeini-ish? Israel isn't right-wing. On the contrary, there was a, a poll in Israel about a week ago uh, which said that about 54% of our nation would welcome a concession, a compromise on territory, and that 23 of them would even give up the whole of the West Bank. But um, that's the situation. Um, in other words, the composition in Parliament does not reflect that's a right. public consensus because the religious parties, most of whom are against annexation and permanent Israeli rule, base their decisions on something quite extraneous, on how many yeshivot they will have and on how they can legislate for the humiliation of American Jews. There is a strong uh, infrastructure of lucid, visionary, moderate, realistic and pragmatic thinking. But you need leadership to bring that to expression. Uh, but, but even if the polls are bad, after all, the polls have never been good. In the olden times, the Jews were all against the Ten Commandments and in favor of the Golden Calf. But then we had leadership. Mr. Ambassador, could a dark horse like Azer Weitzman uh, run for, or obviously he can run, but could he uh, fall in as uh, head of the Labor Party now? Is there enough support for a person like that? My own reading of the situation is that it's uh, not very likely. Nevertheless, if he were to take my advice, I would advise him to run. You cannot lose anything. Sometimes you can be surprised. It's not just a question of winning, which may not be feasible, but if there is a body of opinion based upon what I would call a healthy obsession with the peace idea, by being a candidate, you get a platform for those ideas, and that's just as important as winning office. I made a mistake in 1974 when uh, Rabin and uh, Peres were suggested. I didn't believe they had greater qualifications than myself, either intellectual or international or diplomatic or any other. But my friend at the time, Mr. Sapir, said that they're so solidly entrenched, you will only get 25% and I yielded, I now realize that it's ridiculous. What do you mean only 25%? With 25% in our kind of parties, You're a stakeholder. You, can, uh, you can really achieve a certain basis that was wrong. Why, why, not, why not try? At least there should be somebody around whom those who believe that the achievement of peace is possible and urgent should have uh, somebody around whom they can express that conviction. The East and West together now, Gorbachev and Bush close, trade packs coming together, everything is happening, it's changed. A year ago, none of us expected, even erudite politicians had no idea that this was coming. And it seems that Israel is entrenched in its old system, in its old way. And is it possible that the world is going to bypass it and, and then impose some kind of settlement on Israel to the point where they won't be able to negotiate themselves out of it? Well, your diagnosis, Leon, is correct. The fact is that we're no longer moving with the stream and current of the world. Everywhere the, you see the effects of the democratic um, revolution in Central and Eastern Europe. Those who didn't talk to each other before talk to each other now. Everybody recognized that, uh, recognizes that you cannot have durability for any society that is not based upon consent and equality. And Israel, in relation to the West Bank and Gaza, doesn't base itself on consent or on equality. And to my great shame, I see much more movement in South Africa, where they've allowed the revolutionary violent movement uh, to operate, uh, to hold a big meeting in a soccer field of hundreds of thousands, uh, to go abroad and meet with their colleagues without asking for any conditions. And in those, that situation, the fact that there is a stubborn refusal to understand that we have to make peace with those who, with whom we are not in accord but to say we won't talk to anybody because we don't agree with them, that's ridiculous. If we agreed with them, we wouldn't have to have dialogue. Dialogue is meant for conditions of uh, divergence and even of conflict. That is the worst part of Israeli policy. And I'm sorry that my own party, although it doesn't believe in the policy of not talking to the mainstream Palestinian organizations, has not yet had the courage to say that's all there is. We've got to talk to them or talk to nobody. And if we talk to them, then we open some horizon. If we talk to nobody, then we simply enter a dynamism which, heaven forbid, could lead to disaster. The Lubavitcher rabbi, the rabbi of Lubavitch from Brooklyn, tells uh, two people, Rabbi Vertigay, Rabbi Mizrahi, uh, to go against a uh, 
basically an agreement that was made to abrogate an agreement, your feelings as an Israeli and as a leader? Well, a sense of humiliation. On the lecture circuit, I used to be asked to talk about Israel's bastion of democracy. Well, a democracy is a system in which everybody living under any jurisdiction has exactly the same rights as everybody else under that jurisdiction. And so long as we have this unresolved occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, that isn't true. Moreover, a democracy takes its orders from itself, from its own representatives. Here you have an American rabbi, without any knowledge of the issues, a man so devoted and ardent in his devotion to America that he refuses ever to come to Israel. And he gives orders uh, to uh, two of his devotees uh, to not only just to dismantle an Israeli government, but as an American, he derails an important foreign policy initiative of his own government. President Bush and Secretary Baker worked for 11 months to put together some kind of beginning of a peace process. A rabbi in Brooklyn says, no, he's not going to have it if necessary go to war. Now, uh, it's, a, it's a real blot upon our democracy, but the fault lies not with the Lubavitcher Rebbe in, in, in influencing people, but in people who sit in that parliament in Knesset and who say, we are sitting here, but our views have no importance. We are not able to react to what anybody says. Uh, whatever somebody else outside parliament and outside the country says will um, uh, determine our votes. In that case, why have them there? Why not just have answering machines? If a representative is not free to say, in the last resort, I will express my view if possible, together with my party, and if not possible, then on my own terms, he oughtn't to be in a parliament at all. And everybody who accepts membership of a parliament should be able to say and swear, I promise that I am free, and I'm not uh, under anybody's authority. Supposing the, the, you're under the authority of a bank manager or something, you would say, well, that's corrupt. But why is it not corrupt if you subjugate and subordinate your own opinion, because somebody outside tells you what to do. It's an interesting point. Isn't that in a sense a violation of your oath as a Knesset member to represent the, the people of Israel? And if, you, if you're not doing that, you're in a sense a proxy for another person. So exactly. There's some, there's certainly it's a moral violation. The oath simply says that you will uh, um, respect the state of Israel and you would carry out uh, the decisions of the Knesset. But um, carrying out the decision is only one aspect of a parliamentary duty. If you do not contribute your own independent thought and judgment and appraisal, you really have no moral right to be in the parliament. I think legally, I, I've checked that issue, I think by implication you have a duty to do as, exactly as you say, to, to fulfill the duties uh, of the people that you were elected to serve. And uh, certainly people outside the United States, I mean outside of Israel, sure. were not elected, <laughs> you're not elected to serve them. And what these people say, and I have nothing against Lubavitcher Rabbi or the, <laughs> the, the, the Bob of a Rebbe, but when, you, when you're supposed to serve the man who lives in Cholon, or you're supposed to serve the man in, uh, uh, in, in the West Bank, uh, you can be influenced by reading. I can read something, but when it's a direct uh, proxy vote, there's something wrong there. I think. It, it doesn't hit well. That's why we should have some change of system under which a representative in Parliament represents a specific body of voters, and to them he owes an account of what he is doing. But to own account to somebody who is not even in your own country, that's absurd. 500,000 people signed a petition to President Herzog on uh, Independence Day asking for electoral reform. Mr. Ambassador, you really think that's a possibility now? Uh, there was a vote of 51 against 35 in favor of a moderate reform, which would not destroy the proportional principle, but which would have some kind of constituency representation and which would reduce the number of small parties. Now, I am in favor of that, but there's something of a mystique. I wouldn't say that that is going to cure all these problems because our own disorder, anarchy, fragmentation, I think is a reflection of, uh, of the popular temperament and not just of a mechanical change. We should do the change just to prove whether it's effective or not. To give an example, if our chaotic system were adopted, let's say, in Britain, they would still come out with two big solid parties because that's the way they're built. That's the way their history is. Nevertheless, uh, a condition in which there are 120 members of our parliament, any one of which is open to extortion or persuasion, because any one of them, by translating himself from one party to another, can either bring about or not bring about the fall of a government. I don't know of any system in which 120 people have a power of life and death over a government.
That's literally true. It is life and death. I think one of the most disturbing facts that we Americans saw was uh, uh, Yitzhak Modai shuffling back and forth like he was running the country. I mean, this is a man who controlled one or two votes, possibly three votes, and then one night he's going back to labor, then he's going back to uh, to, to the Likud. Then you have a man called Sharia who was embarrassed by uh, by Shamir, who, who refused to give him a uh, portfolio in the government. He says, I'm now with labor. Now, after Paris cannot form the government, Sharia is bouncing back to Likud. I mean, the world looks at this and sure. says, it's horrific. I mean, how... People are offering themselves for sale. That's not just a question of uh, the system. One should try not to elect the kind of people who are capable of offering themselves for sale. I think that's really the point. I think it's not only the system, it's the people right. who should have a duty and an honor to serve and, and, and a responsibility. And I think that's lacking now, and the world is looking upon that with great askance. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available in bookstores and online in paperback and an e-book for both Kindle and Nook. It's a great way to learn how history was made behind the scenes. Get it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon.com or buy it at Barnes & Noble and get the real story behind the making of the 1978 Camp David Accords. Leon Charney's new book, The Battle of the Talmuds, is now available as an audiobook. This wonderful CD can be ordered directly from the publisher for just $29.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling. Listen as this audiobook explains how Judaism's greatest scholars broke from their own history and gave spirituality to a people without a homeland. And you can also get the audiobook version of Leon Charney's bestseller, The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get a detailed explanation of one of the oldest and most revered prayers in the Jewish religion as Charney's book explains how the Kaddish evolved. Both audiobooks are available directly from the publisher for $29.95 each, plus $12 for shipping and handling. Call 201-944-7600 and order with your credit card. That's 201-944-7600. Immerse yourself in Jewish history. We're back. Uh, we're giving you snippets and a collation of different interviews that I have done with uh, Aubrey Abba Iban. Abba was his Hebrew name, Aubrey was his English name, and uh, you've seen part of the brilliance of this man and how erudite he was, especially in his delivery and oratory. I, I can think of no one who was stronger than Aubrey Iban in, in delivering oratory, and, and this is a world view. By the way, when he came to our studio, when you do a mic check to see how the sound is, he would recite the Koran in Hebrew, something none of us can do, at least around here. Maybe we can find some other people. I'm not sure. In any case, uh, continue to watch us, and uh, we hope that you're gaining some insight into this really remarkable Jewish statesman diplomat. Let's go through some, some memory lane with you. Uh, Ben-Gurion, as a leader. Well, I think one looks back with a sense of longing and gratitude <laughs> to his leadership decisiveness, in general an ability to focus on the important subjects, sometimes creating blindness and darkness all around. He's a searchlight. You uh, focus on one point and there's darkness all around. The questions that he selected for priority were generally the, the right questions. Hi, I'm Weitzman. Well, here's my, my teacher in, in Zionism, a, a, an extraordinary person because um, he is responsible for single-handed for the kind of decisions that brought about the establishment of Israel in the law and the policy of nations at a time when he had no power whatever. The last victory of persuasion without power in diplomatic history uh, with the mandate, the Balfour Declaration, the ratification by the League of Nations, uh, his uh, pioneering of the partition idea. And when he was out of office, uh, if you please, he produced out of office the retention of the Negev by the United States in the Israeli map 
and the recognition of Israel by the United States. On my own television show, I will be playing a record by President Truman, who says it was Weizmann and he alone who persuaded me to recognize Israel 12 minutes after its independence was proclaimed. You told me that great anecdote about uh, Truman comparing Weizmann to Jackson. You said that there, there were never two diverse people, but if that is what it took yes, to make the state of Israel. Me, <laughs> his uh, partner, Jacobson, said to me, the only Zionist that Truman will see will be Weizmann, and only if you can persuade him that Weizmann is like Andrew Jackson, who was the hero president of Truman. Uh, so I said to Jacobson, you go ahead and say what he wants. And then I, my opinion as a student of history is that no two human beings ever walked upon the face of the earth with fewer common attributes <laughs> than Jackson and Weizmann. But I thought that the Jewish state is a superior interest to historical accuracy. You and I first met when I was working as counsel of Senator Hartke, and you were foreign minister to Golda Meir. Golda. Strong and defiant and uh, expressing the strength of element in, in her. But uh, there were two things, very apprehensive about the prospect of peace, very skeptical, excessively skeptical. And she had a certain quality. She couldn't stand good news. <laughs> if you said something to her that was not darkly pessimistic, she resented hearing it. But um, the chief failure is that she was not open enough to the idea of change, the idea that our enemies might change. And uh, changing them is our, the objective of our policy. Our military strength and our diplomacy are oriented on the aim of changing their minds. But sometimes they change their minds and we refuse to take yes for an answer. In 1971, there was much more to explore than she was willing to explore. When Sadat said a peace agreement, we should have explored what he meant. And then, of course, the uh, greatest of all the failures was uh, after Camp David, when the Palestinians begin to say pragmatic, realistic things, we say you shouldn't believe them. You should only believe them when they talk nonsense, but you shouldn't believe them when they begin to talk sense. I believe that there's an attritional process at work in the Arab world, which brings them to despair, however reluctantly, of the possibility of our elimination, and we should listen to that. Even recently, I must tell you that when a Syrian statesman leader, Assad, known for the virulence of his ideology and his rhetoric, says to somebody, not just somebody, but to a former president of the United States, in principle, I'm willing to do a deal or to talk about a deal with Israel, we should at least explore and not suddenly have reactions, or oh, we know that he doesn't mean it, or we know that, it, what do you mean we know? Why not find out and explore? Very few people know much about, at least in the United States, about Moshe Sharet, and you served on him also. Well, I mean, he was, uh, I wouldn't say he was in the front rank of our nation builders, <laughs> but he was certainly the architect of our foreign policy. And at a time when um, moderation and flexibility were not fashionable, he did have the courage to argue for those policies. We know you have to run. Your prophecy, 40 years from now, what's the state of Israel going to look like? Oh, that's nonsense, because the world changes even in four years, not in 40 years. Who remembers what it was like 40 years ago? I'm not interested. I'm interested in what happens in the next year or two in which the fate, the destiny, the structure, and the values of our society will be determined. And um, I think that's what we should do, not simply predict the next three or four years, but we should predict something over which we have control. Well, so what's he was being an astrologer and predicting things over which you have no knowledge and which nobody will remember. The only thing I ever predicted with certainty is that there will not be a nuclear war. And when my friend said, how are you so certain? I said, look, if there isn't a nuclear war, they'd all say Abba Iban was right. If there is a nuclear war, who in God's name will care what Abba Iban said? Will there be a Palestinian entity somehow on the West Bank? Inevitable, because uh, it is impossible in the modern world, the end of this century, to rule a foreign people against its will. I will ask Americans, could you now, with all your strength and power and riches and resourcefulness, supposing you had to rule 120 million non-American foreigners someplace near Mexico without giving them either their civil rights or their national identity, wouldn't you say that you were resigning from history? It's impossible to exert that kind of jurisdiction over a population, half of your own population, without uh, disturbing your social harmony and your regional peace and your international relations. We can find a way of reconciling their freedom with our security. 
I can tell you that a great body of Israeli military opinion believes that in order to have security, you can do that by selective military deployment, but without governing another people against its will. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie. Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels is now available in bookstores and online in paperback and an e-book for both Kindle and Nook. It's a great way to learn how history was made behind the scenes. Get it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Be a witness to history. Order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon.com or buy it at Barnes & Noble and get the real story behind the making of the 1978 Camp David Accords. Leon Charney's new book, The Battle of the Talmuds, is now available as an audiobook. This wonderful CD can be ordered directly from the publisher for just $29.95 plus $12 for shipping and handling. Listen as this audiobook explains how Judaism's greatest scholars broke from their own history and gave spirituality to a people without a homeland. And you can also get the audiobook version of Leon Charney's bestseller, The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get a detailed explanation of one of the oldest and most revered prayers in the Jewish religion as Charney's book explains how the Kaddish evolved. Both audiobooks are available directly from the publisher for $29.95 each, plus $12 for shipping and handling. Call 201-944-7600 and order with your credit card. That's 201-944-7600. Immerse yourself in Jewish history. We're back. Uh, we're giving you snippets and a collation of different interviews that I have done with uh, Aubrey Abba Iban. Abba was his Hebrew name, Aubrey was his English name, and uh, you've seen part of the brilliance of this man and how erudite he was, especially in his delivery and oratory. I, I can think of no one who was stronger than Aubrey Iban in, in delivering oratory, and, and this is a world view. A friend of mine, Ruby Rivlin, who's a uh, Likud member of the Knesset, has a new job. He is now the mediator between Bibi Netanyahu, who doesn't talk to uh, Itzhak Mordechai, and they don't talk to one another. Do you ever hear of an instance where the, the defense minister of Israel is not talking directly to the prime minister? I've never heard of such a case, but the fact is this. Nobody in Israel talks to anybody. <laughs> that's, that's really the fact of the matter. No. They talk and at people, uh, huh? Uh, yes, they rather talk at people, and they talk against people. I remember sitting once in, in the Knesset, and uh, my wife called up and uh, said, uh, um, where is your husband? And she said, he's uh, sitting down with somebody. And uh, she asked, uh, against whom is he having lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Why has Bibi uh, collapsed so? Is it the right, you know, he sold uh, too much of himself in the Y plantation deal and he couldn't carry the right wing or other other reasons? Uh, I think the main reason is that uh, he is not very convincing as a candidate. Uh, first of all, I would not say that um, uh, that uh, addiction to truth is uh, <laughs> one of his <coughs> central attributes. And the, the second reason is this. Uh, he did such a, uh, a revolution in his thinking because uh, he enters the Knesset on the basis of a greater Israel idea. In other words, don't give up anything to anybody. And in the end, we find him uh, shedding larger chunks of territory than anybody else ever conceived of doing. And uh, that, of course, does create a credibility gap. And that's what he's suffering from, uh, from now. Uh, but he should always have suffered from that because uh, he has never been in total harmony uh, with his own views, let alone with the views of other people. David Ben-Gurion, who was your prime minister, and you told him what Harry Truman told you. Did he agree? Was that the stated policy of the Israeli government in 1948? Oh, yes. The policy of the government in 1948 was definitely <coughs> to go along with the partition idea. First of all, it was the only idea which had the slightest possibility of, uh, of triumph. And uh, as, uh, as you know very well from your own experience, we did triumph on the basis of that uh, partition idea. If we had gone on and said, we want the whole of the country as our own, 
nobody would have believed it. Nobody would have accepted it. Nobody would possibly have harmonized with it. And uh, therefore the concept of partition, namely that this is a land of, of two peoples and two doctrines and uh, two sets of national experience, that is a very essential part of the very tradition on which uh, David Ben-Gurion built his uh, consensus. So if things would have turned out differently, had the Arabs not attacked you in 1948, obviously there would be no problem. They would have had their own state. Is that, is that a fact? Would it have been a Palestinian state? People well, didn't talk uh, about Palestine in those days, did they? They didn't talk about Palestine, but there was a Palestine people. There was a Palestine nationhood. There was a, a, a Palestinian conception. Uh, and uh, the Palestinians uh, gradually became part and part of the national consciousness of uh, Israelis as well as of uh, the Arab part of uh, the Palestinian community. And uh, therefore, but now, uh, to get up in the middle of uh, this century, at the end of 50 years, and say, no, we, 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 we've changed our view, and uh, the whole of the country belongs to us. That isn't convincing. It doesn't really convince anybody. When did that uh, uh, policy come to effect? Was that through Menachem Begin, when he was elected? Because well, he, yeah. he was first one of the fetal labor candidate. Otherwise, the labor governments were in there since 48. Well, that's a, that's a very strange result. Namely, uh, Menachem Begin became the protagonist of uh, a Jewish state. And um, of course, he did a lot, a certain amount of uh, space and of time and of preoccupation to the Arab community as well. But um, fundamentally, it is Menachem Begin. And that was the surprise, because everybody thought of Menachem Begin as the protagonist and as the supporter of uh, an integrated uh, Israel extending on both sides of the Jordan, if you please. And uh, here along came Mr. Begin himself. And he said, no, let me make do with a split up uh, between the two entities. Uh, to, uh, because in, in terms of moral judgment, you cannot deny to the Arab community its place in the sun. This trip, I went to Gaza and saw the Palestinian yes. National Council vote. In fact, I was in there by mistake. I nearly voted, you know, <laughs> in the council. Had the wrong badge on. Uh, and it, it seemed to me that this was sort of like 1948 for, for the Jewish nation, you know, that there was great excitement there amongst the Arabs. They were Arab uh, nationalist Palestinians from all over the world. There were Americans there. They, uh, they came from all over. And this was like uh, an exciting time for them. It was, they felt it was the birth of their nation. In reality, Shimon Peres said that they, they had signed uh, or had done this three years ago. And what nearly happened there was they raised their hands and they confirmed what happened three years ago. Is that a fact? Yes, that's very true because in 1996, uh, they had come together. They had voted for uh, an Arab state. And uh, nobody quite understands to this very day uh, why that uh, idea fell apart. It really fell apart because Bibi Netanyahu said that, no, you haven't agreed on anything yet. You haven't said anything that we can attach our names to. And uh, he therefore went through the whole process once again. Uh, I think people got rather bored with it because Palestinian nationhood is now an accepted axiom of, uh, of, of Israeli thought. People in Israel do not believe that we can build a state without uh, an adjacent Arab state. And that, of course, was the, the very large concept that uh, my late friend Harry Truman brought along when he said, no, you, you have to agree that uh, this is a partition between two countries, two nations, two states, two national experiences, and you can't get away from that uh, historical logic, especially as at the time uh, we were talking of two million Arabs and uh, five million Jews. I've quoted you uh, the last time you were on the show. You told me that Arafat could declare a state uh, any time he wants, and most of Europe would recognize. He'd probably get 150 countries to recognize them overnight. So in essence, uh, you have a de facto Palestinian state. What I noticed uh, in Israel, Ambassador, was that when this vote, when I came back to Jerusalem after this vote, and we, we were sitting around with all the press and uh, some of the liberals and not liberals, there was a little bit of uh, trepidation, fear amongst all the Israelis, even the, even the left-wing people, because at this point they have to really learn how to cohabit, to, to work together, and they're, they're not sure how 
it goes because the government is not really leading him into a path that gives them a feeling that they've really done something. What uh, Netanyahu talks about all the time is security. Everybody wants security. Mm -hmm. and, but in terms of economic movements, in terms of, uh, of uh, barter, in terms of employment, no one's sure how it's going to work. Is there a plan out there? Does ba Barack have a plan? I think Barack does have a plan. I think he's a very lucid uh, sort of man. He has a very pragmatic approach to these problems. And because he's a pragmatist, I, th I understand that he, does, he believes in the concept of partition. Because if you don't believe in partition, then you have nothing in which to believe. The, the other belief, which tells you that everything is ours, everything is, our, everything is not ours. And uh, there are centers of Arab life and of Arab culture and of Arab language and of uh, Muslim precedents. Uh, all these are part of the, of the general texture of uh, the Israeli nation. And uh, therefore, there are some people who would go further and who would say, you cannot really have an effective Jewish state unless there is an Arab state next door to it, because the Arab state would at least siphon off many of the prerogatives and many of the uh, cultures. And um, I myself believe that. I believe that uh, an Arab so state So you would keep the identity of a Jewish state safe, in a sense? Yes, the Jewish state would be safe because it would uh, represent a reality. Whereas uh, to say that the whole of our country is a, a kind of a mixture, it's, it's both an Arab state and a Jewish state, that simply isn't convincing because uh, the, the Arabs, like the Jews of Israel, uh, are the possessors and the heirs and the inheritors of uh, a whole tradition. And uh, this uh, tradition must lead us to the acceptance of Arab state. When people say to you this, do you trust the Arabs? What, what is your answer to them? My answer to them is this. I trust the Arabs not to make fools of themselves. And they would be making fools of themselves if they believed for a single moment that uh, they could rival Israel in uh, military power uh, or in uh, economic cohesion. Uh, after all, Israel really is a success story. 5.8 million Jews to start with, increased and uh, lavishly endowed by the Jewish people in the diaspora. Together with that, uh, an economy, which is a very buoyant economy. I hear that uh, we almost rival uh, some countries like Japan and like the United Kingdom in our gross national product. Together with that, uh, an army, which is uh, the pride of the Israeli nation and which is fully capable of securing the, the dignity and the pride of the Jewish people as a whole. When you put all those things together, the e economy, uh, together with the, it, its productivity, uh, together with the fact that it is a harmonization of uh, so many different elements coming from all over the world, you get the system, you get the concept of a power. Now, Israel is the largest regional power in the Middle East, and therefore I don't understand what the Jews are talking about if they go around saying, oh, the destruction of Israel, Israel can be destroyed. Israel cannot be destroyed. Israel has long passed the threshold of destructibility. What about the terrorism? How, how do you combat terrorism? Well, you combat terrorism by uh, putting the terrorists away, by uh, eliminating them from the picture. And uh, my own feeling is this, and this is not just a subjective feeling. The terrorist movement has lost a great part of its appeal. Um, even a man like uh, Sheikh Yassin uh, no longer believes everything that he says himself. And uh, I don't believe that terrorism is the central theme of Israeli existence. And that's why w one issue on which I differ from Netanyahu. Netanyahu goes around saying, terrorism, 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 until you get uh, subdued into the idea that terrorism is the central theme of Israeli life. A lot of Israeli life goes on without the terrorist uh, cloud breaking over our heads. Yeah, most people live in Israel pretty well. And although you see it on television here, mm. the, the life in Israel is very pretty normal. Life is very normal in Israel, mm. and I would say it's much more than normal. There's a great uh, plethora, there's a tremendous burst of uh, initiative in Israel Especially itself. Especially in high-tech today. Yeah, I think high-tech is the central theme of Israeli life now. We're a very important computer country. We're a very important scanner company. 
uh, we uh, really go into the uh, in, into the, the guts and the essence of uh, of uh, the body uh, in, in, in so many ways, and that's why I, I do not believe that Israel is uh, surmountable, and the idea that Israel is a candidate for destruction should be banished totally from our minds. It's very important because there are people who start to talk like that now. I mean, there's so much splintering in Israel, which leads me to my next question. The division between the secular and the, and the religious. What is happening over there? Well, what's happening is, to my sorrow, the uh, very uh, extremist religious party uh, has created a dominance um, within the religious Zionist camp. And uh, that's very dangerous because uh, uh, the, uh, if you take religious Zionism to its extreme and you uh, create a myth of Zionism, which totally obliterates the very existence of uh, the Arab uh, community, the Arab entity, you fall into a system which invites disillusionment. Israel is, it is a Jewish state. It isn't only a Jewish state. And there is an Arab dimension to that uh, statehood. And that Arab dimension will have to be fulfilled in uh, some kind of way, probably through the existence side by side with a Jewish state. And that, after all, was the uh, genius of uh, Harry Truman, that he understood from the very first moment that uh, when you say a Jewish state, you're almost saying an Arab state side by side with it. And that was his policy. Well, going back in history, Marshall was against Truman. He was the uh, Secretary of uh, State. And he said he would resign from the cabinet if, uh, if Truman went ahead and, and recognized Israel. We saw they did do it. Was the main reason Marshall against it, was it, was it oil? Was it, or he was afraid that uh, they would, what, what was his problem, Marshall? My own feeling about uh, Marshall at that time is this. Um, he was subject to a great fear. And he, he had the following fear. He thought that uh, Israel would be totally engulfed, totally swamped because of the, the Arab armies, and that uh, then uh, is the Israelis would clamor for support by the United States, and the Israelis would say, for God's sake, help us out. We are, we're in a mess, as we are now. I think that was... Uh, so that, it had nothing to do that, with anti-Semitism or anything like that? It was, it was a policy of his? I think his policy, I think he was definitely afraid, and I had some talks with him at the time. He was afraid that Israel just couldn't make it. And now, if you uh, take the uh, Israeli army as it was, uh, five or six uh, uh, airplanes uh, put together with uh, chewing gum and, and, and rope, <laughs> that's what, what we had. Robot of that, Weizmann. That's what Weizmann <coughs> had, to, had, to, had to parade, and, uh, and uh, the, the sort of armies that we had. And uh, the, the fact that we were totally outnumbered in terms of numbers of uh, divisions and of brigades and of companies. When you put all that together, you could make a strong case for saying, listen, the, the Jews are very gallant <laughs> about this. They just will not be able to make it. I remember sitting around with a, uh, uh, in uh, President Weizmann's presence uh, with a French representative, and the French representative was saying all the time, well, of course, uh, you people are very gallant and you're very constructive and creative, but you just cannot, cannot make it. At that moment, the door opened and in came a guy uh, from uh, the, the, the New York Post, and the headline was Israel captures uh, Mishmar HaEmet, <laughs> which was one of the key points in the uh, Israeli map. Can I ask a question? You were not born in Israel. What impelled you to be a Zionist? Uh, first of all, I, did, I, had, first of all I, I had a choice. I could have done uh, one of three things. Uh, I could have entered Parliament, because that was open to me, at the time, the Labour Party? in the Labour Party, because uh, uh, Mr. Lasky, who was then the chairman of the party, said, why don't you come and join with us? Uh, or I could have uh, stayed uh, with the foreign ministry, of which I was then an integral part. Um, of the British uh, foreign ministry? Yes, of the British foreign ministry. So I, ha I had the, the, those two options. Or I could have simply gone back to Cambridge and continued cool. to do my research. And I turned all of these three things down. People in my family thought I was just crazy. Yeah, why did you do that? I don't know. I think that uh, because it, that was a what I call a poetic decision. It was not a prosaic decision. It was a decision which was very much inspired by the fact that the Jewish people was really in a terrible mess. The, the Jews showed every uh, disposition to become uh, 
swamped by Arab violence. Uh, we then took the Arab violence seriously. Perhaps we should not have taken them so seriously. As soon as the uh, Arab armies got uh, away from the parade ground, uh, they lost a great deal of their mystique. But so long as they were on the parade ground stamping their feet and, mm. and saluting everybody like mad, uh, we all thought that they were very formidable indeed. And uh, my, I had this terrible feeling that uh, the Jews were going to go under. And uh, I was one of those who really feared that uh, we, the Jews of uh, Eretz Israel, of the land of Israel, were not going to make it. We, 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 we were very gallant, but we would not really uh, be able to make a decisive uh, breach in the Arab world. Were you fluent in Hebrew at that time? Yes, I had learned uh, Hebrew as a result of my long immersion in the Hebrew language. And uh, I think that was one of the things which brought me to the idea that I could really talk to Israelis in their language. May 4th, 1999, Yasser Arafat uh, claims maybe he will not, he will declare a state. Does that have any real significance if he does or he doesn't, or it's a, it's a fait accompli at this point? I have a feeling that he would be making a great mistake if he proclaimed a state, because you, uh, a state is something that's going to happen anyway. And um, He would irritate it, people this way? If it's going to happen anyway, then why not let it happen when it happens? And uh, but to act unilaterally, that's the great uh, forbidden word now, uh, to act unilaterally by declaring a Palestine state, he would be falling outside the uh, international context and he might, have, uh, he might be endangering uh, the, the prospect of uh, a response because if the Arabs are left alone and they proclaim their statehood, they could well get 150 votes in favor of recognizing that statehood. But if they act out of turn, uh, by uh, uh, not obeying the idea of uh, consensus, uh, unilateralism. If they, if they do that, they might, they might lose the, the, their card. So if you were giving them advice, which you don't want to do, I'm <laughs> sure you would tell them not to, 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 to try and unilaterally declare a state on May, in May 4th. Yes, I have in fact suggested to <coughs> them that uh, they, they wait until the thing falls into their lap. And it's going to fall into their lap because uh, if they act in concert, and in harmony with the uh, rest of the world, I think they won't have any difficulty in creating a recognition context for their statehood. And therefore, my advice to them is uh, take it easy. Do you think uh, the policy of Israel in 67, after you captured all the, all the lands, was it a little bit of hubris there? Oh, yes, there was a quite a, a lot of hubris because uh, we thought that since we own now the whole of the territory, if you please, from the Golan Heights to the Suez Canal, about five times more than we ever expected to have. Um, I think we let that get into our blood, blood a little too much. Now, it was quite impossible for Israel to defend the whole area from the Suez Canal uh, to the Golan Heights. How could that be done unless we were prepared to make Israel into a land of uh, barracks and uh, a land of uh, military officers, um, how could we possibly sustain the weight of uh, that burden? Uh, how could we uh, be defending the West Bank on the one hand, the Suez Canal on the other hand, the Golan Heights on the, on the third hand? It was simply beyond our power. And when you start thinking ahead of your power, then uh, you're likely to lose everything. We hope you've enjoyed our special about Aubrey Abba Ivan. Uh, we certainly send our condolences to his wife and his family. We know his wife and, and Aubrey himself was a great uh, fan of our show and, and an ardent fan. And uh, he certainly will be missed by us as a viewer. And we will certainly miss him as every Jew or every intelligent person in the world will because this man spoke and delivered such oratory that it, it is really irreplaceable. We'll see you next week.